Shout out to all the Patreon supporters that help make content like this flow. If you wanted access to exclusive videos, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and heck, so much more, then come on by. What is up, everyone? It's your boy Shaf, aka That Mill Guy, coming at you with a video talking about how Modern Mill beats Modern Burn. That's right, a return to a series that I used to do, well, both in video form and kind of as articles, and I just wanted to bring it back because I think a lot of people would gain some type of value from this, especially from a lot of y'all returning to paper magic, not having played a lot of online magic, if at all. So just kind of refreshing your minds as to some archetypes and just some things that have pained Mill for a while. Especially when it comes to Burn, this has historically been a very unfavored matchup for the archetype, and in a lot of ways still is, especially for the Demir variants. But if you look at Azorius and Esper, if you look at kind of the tools that the deck can employ, especially post board, we start to see that the matchup is actually relatively favored. You, you can get it there with white but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. The way I want to structure these style of videos, and you know, you let me know if you want to see videos like this in the future and what archetypes you want to see. I'm, I want to structure this video first and foremost by going through the mentality of each one of the strategies. So I'm going to go through the mentality of what Burn wants to do against Mill, what Mill wants to do against Burn. Then we're going to go through a bunch of key cards in each one of the strategies, how they're employed against each one of the archetypes themselves. And then finally, we're going to go through a game plan. So talking about what burn generally wants to do as a game plan, and then talk about generally what mill has in store as a game plan as well. So hopping right into it past this meme right here. Let's hop into the burn list itself. Now, generally, we know that burn hasn't really changed much. The creature spell suite is relatively the same. It has not picked up Ragavan or Dragon's Rage Chandler in large popularity, really just Goblin Guide, Swift Spear, and Eidolon. And then we see the regular kind of suite of Boros Charms, Lightning Bolts, and Rip Bolts, whatever, right? Like the deck list hasn't really changed. The big sideboard card that I want to talk about later in the video is going to be Roiling Vortex. So really just in terms of mentality, this deck just wants to get you from 20 to zero very quickly. In a lot of ways, especially when we're playing Esper Mill, that's a lot easier for them because our mana base is a little bit more painful. We gotta we gotta pay for the return that we get on cards like Blossoming Calm, but again, don't wanna get too far ahead of ourselves. There's a lot of things to talk about here in ways that the deck can actually attack Mill in a lot of ways that people forget that aren't just direct damage like Lava Spike. And there's a lot of things that if we let them untap with, we functionally have lost the game. So we have to be really careful with when we use a removal and how we use it. But again, they're not doing anything complicated. Their main board plan is very straightforward, just hitting you in the face. They're not going to divulge from that. But post board, they obviously have access to things like Roiling Vortex, which we'll definitely get into just because it's a very problematic card. And that can be a way to kind of slow us down. But really, they're not doing anything to change their plan. And that's the key thing to remember about Burn against Mill. They're not divulging because our plan isn't better than their plan. They know that. They know that their plan is better. So we have to become the control deck. And that brings me into what? Well, the Mill deck wants to do. Now, I'm going to go over specifically Esper tools and uh, Azorius tools later in the video. But I just wanted to take a look at my specific Demir Mill build. And of course, if you wanted sideboard guides to this, that's all available for free in the Discord, link down below. But the tools that Demir has are really just Crypt Incursion. Right now, we're not really playing any other great form of life gain, and Crypt Incursion isn't really the best plan. Again, like I've said, the burn decks know that their plan is better than ours, so we have to circumvent that a little bit. We have to understand what our win conditions are. And our win condition right now, as a primary plan, is going to be to delay the game through Crypt Incursion, to win with some level of successive Hedron Crabs and Archive Traps, which is our fastest way to win the game, or to stabilize with the Crypt Incursion to the point where we can cast the Tasha's for lethal. Remembering that the deck has a relatively low CMC, a lot of two CMC spells, but still relatively the average CMC that you can get out of Tasha's isn't that bad, especially we can get off a couple of mills and some blocks with, with the crabs, you can get there. In the post-board uh, scenario, with Demir specifically, we have access to cards like Aethergust, Test of Talents, and Extirpate. 
Now we're going to talk about those cards specifically as some of them don't feel as nuanced. Like you're not really understanding why we would remove four surgical extractions, but then bring back in the extirpate. But remember that we're becoming the control deck, especially in the game one when we realize they played that turn one, um, the turn one inspiring vantage, and then they play the goblin guide. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta switch that mentality a little bit. Those removal spells or the spells that you have in your hand will start to immediately have a different purpose. You're not trying to race them. You're trying to control. You're trying to mitigate and then go all out, all at once once you've dealt with their threats. And as I finally said, I'm gonna say this for the third time, their plan is better than yours. You need to mitigate, you need to stop because they will always have more plans than you. If you're thinking about a scenario where, oh, what if they top deck this? What if they have this? Play like they have it. Trust me, there's so much, uh, there's so much, I should say, redundancy in the burn deck. They will always have that three damage. Play around like they have that three and tell you what, they might even just have that four. Boros Charm is a thing. So that's the general mentality. The burn deck knows their plan is better, so they'll just hit you in the face. You as a mill player need to mitigate and control. You will never be able to race the burn player reliably, obviously. There's the archive trap draws. And obviously, there's the crazy huge and crab draws. But even the huge and crab draws require a crypt incursion to help mitigate the game. So remember that. First and foremost, I'm going to talk about some of the cards that the burn players employ against us and what they're looking to do with these cards and what we can do. So first and foremost, we know that Goblin Guide is probably one of the best uh, one-drop red creatures uh, ever printed really uh, just one mana two two haste very simple the downside of it being that when it attacks defending player reveals a top card and then if it's a land card put it in your hand so in, in some cases especially playing 22 lands we do get the rare putting into our hand so we get to cycle through a little bit look for our spells and this goblin guide helps us dig the great boost is obviously Ruin Crab now blocks this. Hedron Crab was always chomping, but Ruin Crab now blocks this cleanly. So that's a big upgrade for us there. The other thing that I find that a lot of people forget is that you can control what you're drawing off the top with the fetch line. Remember that Goblin Guide attacks, it triggers, you look at the top card. You can then choose to a fetch to remove the top card of your library let's say you don't want to draw it let's say you're on turn two they pay the goblin guide you're casting a turn three uh, you're you're drawing a fractured sanity that's not exactly the card you want to draw against a deck like this especially if you don't have something like crypt incursion you're looking for removal or you're looking for life gain so you might want to fetch that away and make sure you're not drawing that top card so goblin guide can be a very valuable piece of information and we're able to block it with the ruin crab but it's definitely one of their better openers so something to be aware of there Eidolon of the Great Rebel is probably the is probably the single worst thing that we can have resolve against us. And that's generally just because a lot of our mitigating pieces end up being two or less. I'm thinking especially post-board, where we bring in stuff like Aether Gust and Extirpate, even Test of Talents, Fatal Pushes in the main board, Ruin Crabs as blockers. It stops all of that. Thankfully, a way we have mitigated this over time is when you think about something like Fractured Sanity or Tasha's. Yeah, no, I'm joking, folks. That did not mitigate anything. Our deck actually got worse against Burn. Yeah, so that's something to definitely always remember. The mill decks never stopped, but the main board package just became worse. Just became worse. All of them being 3 CMC, Archive Trap is our only saving grace against that. Obviously, this is a matchup where you do not want to be casting Surgical Extraction with your life, especially when Eidolon creates that as a 4 life swing attacking for two we're still able to block this with a zero three ruin crab but converted mana cost three or less that's our whole package there's no way of getting around this this is what you save your removal spells for and if you have a surgical attraction in the game one scenario guess what folks this is what you're using it against it's generally worth the two life in a lot of ways especially if you're able to be even or ahead this is a great thing that you don't want your opponent top decking because then obviously as we mentioned, Tasha's is one of our more reliable primary closers. This is something that we don't want taxed with life by Eidolon. So moving on, we have Boros Charm. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is really twofold. So first and foremost, four damage to target creature or planeswalker. The four damage is what's very relevant here. And the target is going to matter with some of the cards that white has access to. But four is big because not only do you have to play around three life or uh, being at seven where your opponent can hit you with the boros charm plus three but you also again 
always have to be playing around three and six life. All right, you have to be playing around three and four life. You have to be playing around six and seven life. And Boar's Charm is the reason why. Because of the white mana cost, remember always, folks, that Burn does not play a single basic planes. And this is not going to matter so much for the Helixes because the life gain on their end, you're not really worried about that. You're here to stop Boros Charm when you Field of Ruin your opponent's white sources. So if your opponent's a little light on lands and they're not finding their fetches, Field of Ruining their white sources aggressively can be a great way to control and mitigate, as we said, their game plan so they're not able to double spell or efficiently cast the spells out of their hand. Once you start going through a couple turns where you notice there's a, a, a card or two that they're holding up, you can start guesstimating i guess is the way to say it that they might have a lightning helix in their hand or a boris charm in their hand because if you field of, uh you field of ruined away the white sources finally i'm going to bring up that permanence they control are indestructible this is going to matter mostly for the uh demir pilots out there where our primary source of removal is really just fatal push obviously with esper and azorius we gain access to something like prismatic ending but the permanence gaining indestructible is very important, especially because generally you don't really want to bring in board wipes against this matchup. And one of the more favored points in the game against burn is if they have a creature heavy draw, because obviously you can then remove them off the battlefield and you can then crypt incursion. And that's that spells that you don't have to worry about them casting at instant speed. It's just playing to the board. Obviously, Boros Charm protects that. So that's something to be aware of. Roiling Vortex is going to be probably the last card I want to mention here, where this coming out of the board is going to be the, the second most problematic card outside of Eidolon. Roiling Vortex on player's upkeep is going to be a way for them to grind. So, first and foremost, one damage to us. They're grinding us out because that's what we want to do to them. We want to mitigate. We want to control. We want to become the control deck. Roiling Vortex plays straight into that. Not fun. Now, when a player casts a spell, if no mana is spent to cast it, five damage to us. So, if this is out, really be careful with your archive traps, folks. I, honestly, if this is out, you're probably not casting your archive traps ever again. Now, as a Demir pilot, you don't have many answers to this. You just have to hope that you can get out your archive traps early, because honestly, most of the time, you're probably not going to gain back enough life where you're going to be able to uh, cast those archive traps for zero ever again. So, that second paragraph is going to be restricting those four cards. Finally, your opponents can't gain life this turn. This becomes the final problematic piece because our one of our biggest uh, proponents that I keep pushing is mitigating, mitigating damage, mitigating that uh, kind of aggression that the burn player has, and that's through life gain. This is a big reason why you don't really see skull cracks because Roiling Vortex does three other things at the same time as skull crack. So one mana activating this. This is something you always have to play around. You always. Oh, let me repeat this. You always have to be aware of and play around in all aspects of the game. If they have mana up for it, they will use it. They're not going to try to cast Lightning Bolt or whatever. So the opportunities you get for when they are tapped out, that is when you need to gain as much life as possible. This is going to be the exemplification of you do not need to get greedy against your burn opponent take what you can get at the opportunities you get them like gaining six life and not going for the greedy nine with your crypt incursion is much better than gaining zero when your opponent is allowed to untap with this they resolve it blah 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 be careful Skullcrack is obviously worth a mention here, and this is going to be one of those things that you really have to worry about in the main board scenario. They do bring some amount of copies in from the sideboard, but burn players will play uh, at least one to two in the main board. So this is something to be aware of when two mana is being held up. You have to be aware of it play around it because this is going to be one of those things that really decides a game one or game two if the games are generally even you're both are casting spells maybe you're milling them out at the same rate that they're dealing damage to you this is going to be the great equalizer just as how crypt incursion is going to be the great equalizer for you that's how you win the game skull crack is how they win the game honestly they outside of the damage they do this is this is the card that seals the game for them crypt incursion is how we seal the game so you have to understand at what point are you going to be able to win how do you maneuver yourself into a scenario where maybe you can bait your opponent into casting spells and try and going for the win because they see your maybe arms down but you got a crypt incursion 
in the backup. Again, as a Demir pilot, I'm not mentioning many of the tools that we got in Esper because we're going to go into them in a sec. But again, main board playing around rolling vortex is going to be that's going to have more copies in general usually three to four copies in the sideboard that's something you're more worried about in the sideboard but game one skull crack is definitely something so going into the general tools first and foremost that demir has going into the card specifically let's go into test of talents out of the sideboard so this is going to be a great way to stop top decks and that's really what it is once you're able to remove all of the Boros Charms, once you're able to remove all of the Searing Blazes that get rid of your Crabs, that can now just be used to Chump, you don't have to worry about the top decks. And that's the big thing that Test of Talents provides. This is why you're playing this instead of maybe something like uh, a Spell Pierce or Counter Target Instant or whatever it is. The ability to get rid of all copies of the card you counter is a key point. You can then play around other spells much more efficiently because then you are able to control and understand by numbers based on what you're milling based on what you've already exiled what cards they have left instead of just guessing oh it's going to be one out of four of the burn spells that we have no now it's going to be one of the two one of the three because you milled out some amount you've test of talents and surgical you know them out so this is why this card is very very key obviously not the most efficient spell remembering that your opponent is usually casting one mana instance one mana sorceries the test of talents value comes from the fact that you exile the rest so it may not be used against the first spell that you see like the lava spikes but it's very valuable against the skull cracks even if they're only playing two very valuable against the boros charms and then again stuff like searing blazes if you've got a crab heavy hand and you want to play to the blocking uh, and the blocking game really and stop the board finally extirpate out of demir is going to be one of the bigger pieces you have just because even though you remove Surgical Extraction, you have to remember that Surgical is still one of the most powerful cards that Mill has access to in its arsenal. The effect is really unmatched, and it's a big reason why you're playing Test of Talents. So Extra Paid is going to be there to, again, remove extra copies. It's going to be a great way to catch instants as well. Just because the split is second, you obviously can get sorceries, but you do, instead of targeting the Lava Spikes, you want to try and prioritize stuff like the lightning bolts stuff like the boros charms things that really will get you where you mill them out to zero and they try and win on upkeep these are the type of cards that you want to stop with split second and really being as efficient as possible it's one black it's not costing you life it's what you want thing to remember obviously is at some point where you become the controlling deck and you're trying to play to the mid game and hell even the late game if you get there this does exile copies of the card from the graveyard and obviously playing the control game you may not be casting as many mill spells early so getting any type of value off of visions and beyond is going to be really important so extirpate forcibly exiling cards out of the graveyard might be problematic in terms of min maxing so be really wary of that when you're trying to get this going if you exile two copies of card from your graveyard just because you suspect they have one in hand remember that okay this is going to be my win condition, removing cards from their hand, not drawing with visions. That's what you have to establish at that point in the game. Or maybe you just hold off with extra bait because you're trying to find that extra mill spell to win because you realize you won't win the you won't win that long game. But if you know you'll win that long game, play the extra bait, get the cards out of their hand. You, you can play to the visions later. And then obviously Crypt Incursion just gets a good just you know, obviously I mentioned this is the primary way that Demir mill mitigates and wins the game not through milling most of the time it's going to come to have i found my crypt incursion have i played around skull crack and then in the post board have i played around roiling vortex get this resolved you're really hoping for a creature heavy draw from your opponent where you can mill them over or uh sorry destroy those creatures and unfortunately it's one of the reasons that demir mill sees a big downturn against burn because this is really the only tool that they have that's reliable it's got to be creature based against a deck that, well, tries to burn you out with spells. So next up, Loros of the Dream Den is going to be my transition into the Azorius and really the other packages here. Because the big thing that I think people always forget is this card has lifelink. It's three mana or six mana in total. Put it in your hand, then cast it. It's got lifelink. So if you feel like you've dealt with all of the direct damage sources, like for example, you've uh, a surgical extraction or sorry extirpated all of the searing blazes and you've tested talent all the lightning bolts and the chance of them drawing a lightning helix is so low 
Well, cast Loras of the Dream Den, get a Chump Block out there. You will be able to kill most of the creatures that they cast. Maybe a Monastery Swift Spear gets high enough, but especially in the late game where you're able to cast Loras of the Dream Den safely, maybe you're able to get it out. You're able to kill a creature, gain three life, and that becomes a five point life swing. That's damage that they haven't dealt to you because of the creature that they have. And then that's three life gain, five point life swing. Got to do the math there, and that can be five life that you need to win that game. Winning at one is the same as winning at 20. Age old saying. Finally, we're going into the Azorius and the Esper Mill list, and I'm going to kind of throw them together. These are lists, again, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, that I have sideboard guides to in the Mill Discord. So check those out there. Obviously, the list might be a little bit outdated based on the recording of the video, but again, it's all there. This is just what I'm working with at the time of recording. So the big highlight pieces here, I'm looking at stuff like Prismatic Ending in the main board, and that's going to help in the post board against something like Roiling Vortex, being able to deal with any permanent. And obviously we have access to funkier things like Kaya's Guile in the main board, where Kaya's Guile can create chump block situations, it can create exile situations where your opponents are unable to recast things with Luros. And obviously the incidental 4 life is very important on top of the get your opponent to sack, gain the 4 life, Again, six point life total. They swing in with the goblin guide. Maybe you draw a land, you get them to sack, you gain four, you gain, you draw a card, and you gain six life in that way. Pretty good exchange when it, when it comes to that. So it's a big reason why people prefer to maybe play two in the main board. I personally do prefer the Crypt Incursion just because I find that the current modern metagame is very creature heavy. You do get a lot of value out of Crypt Incursion. Obviously, against the burn matchups, we have access to powerful cards in our sideboard, so I think it's fine. And then obviously we see that in things like Blossoming Calm. Still have the Extirpate, still have the Test of Town, still have that second Crypt Incursion. Well, Blossoming Calm is going to be the big one. If we move into the Azorius mill list, it's give or take the same. We, we don't have access to stuff like Crypt Incursion, Kaya's Guile. So that can be a little bit tricky, but we still have very powerful sideboard cards. And well, the same package in Calm, Test, but then we get access to something like Timely Reinforcements, which can actually be extremely valuable in terms of life swings. You're thinking of Chump Blockers on top of 6 life. Pretty good. You're paying one more mana for the counterpart that just got printed in the, one of the more recent sets. It's uh, Sunset Revelry, where you're gaining 4 life, creating 2 1-1 one -one soldier creature tokens, and you replace it. But I find that the one extra mana for Timely, just to, just to gain that one extra Chump Blocker, and also just to... Well, gain the two extra life is massive when it really comes in handy. And that's what's important. You want to create life swings. You want to create scenarios for yourself, which are favorable for you. And any amount of life is important. And even one more chump blocker can help you destroy that Monastery Swift Spear that's now a 2-3. And you can now throw all three blockers at it and kill it, giving yourself that two-point life swing, clearing the board there, and then also gaining the life off the timely. So you're fine there. Now, Kai's Guile, I kind of spoke about already at all points. Each opponent sacrificing a creature, getting around any hexproof effects your opponent might have, exiling opponent's graveyards if you're getting to that long game and your opponent's casting the Luros. A mode like that is very valuable. Creating a Chump Blocker is also very important. And then gaining four life. If you're at that late game scenario, you can just entwine it for six and get all modes. Pretty damn good. So very relevant card. And it's very nice that it has just incidental life gain. That's just really the big thing about this card. Timely Reinforcements, I also may, uh, mentioned. Again, the one more mana I feel like is really valuable. It's It does so much for you. The two life, the one more soldier, much better than Sunset Revelry. A lot of times just being able to replace this card isn't terribly relevant. You have a lot of late game engines. Visions of Beyond is very important, is a thing. Lures of the Dream Den is a thing. You just need to survive more turns. Two more life. One more chump blocker, that's what gets you there. Not necessarily extra cards. Blossoming Calm is the big one. Now, this is a card that I don't see enough people play. If you have access to white, this is going to be one of the more slam dunk cards that you can ever put in your sideboard. Obviously, very niche. This is just for the burn matchup. Literally, just for any spell-heavy burn, deal damage here, face type of matchup. That's what Blossoming Calm is for. You gain Hexproof until your next turn. So you, so you gain Hexproof this turn. You gain Hexproof for your opponent's turn. And then you stop gaining Hexproof of Wait, then you can exile it as it resolves and it recasts itself on its, on its upkeep. So then you gain Hexproof again for your turn. Then you gain Hexproof again for your opponent's next turn. And then for one mana, you've gained Hexproof for four turns. You have stopped all of their Lava Spikes, their Rift Bolts, 
all of their sorcery speed pieces of damage you have stopped in all ways shape and form and of course across both casts you gain four life it's all about the life swings it's all about the mitigating this is a very 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 powerhouse worthy uh, kind of status worth a card not not really big in terms of life gain it's not the timely reinforcement of the crypt incursions of the world but it's that mitigation that control is what you're looking for you're stopping your opponent from casting spells to you which is providing you valuable information because then you're looking at things like boros charm lava spike that they can't target you with and you can start formulating okay what's in their hand and maybe if i have that extra bait maybe if i have that test of talents what am i trying to target with either one of these spells so again information is valuable and mitigation is key so finally uh i think i just have this up because i was trying to see if there was any like solid plans for planning for the early game but it doesn't look like it looking at this uh, for planning for the early game some of it is still relevant but i mean it's fine we're going into specifics here we're gonna go into now the really early mid late game so what does burn want to do to you at all stages of the game well not much changes take you from 20 to zero in the early game it wants to establish first and foremost a threat or two it wants to make your sp it wants to diverge your spells so it wants you to use mana the deck wants you to use mana as a mill player to destroy its creatures while it's slinging spells at your face unfortunately necessary evil that we have to go through but it's obviously very profitable when you think of something like crypt incursion you get your payments later you just need to prevent the damage on board and then it's going to be in the mid game looking to hold up mana for the roiling vortex activations and skull crack your burn opponent realizes, again, as I said in the beginning of the video, their game plan is better than your game plan. They just need to play it right. They have the mana and they're just waiting for you to tap out and make that wrong move. Do not make that wrong move. You don't need to start establishing a board presence if you're behind. You can't catch up with this deck, not necessarily in the traditional form. You need to deal with all their answers one for one, maybe even a couple for one if you can get there, once they're in top deck mode and you have a ton of extra mana, that's when you start employing your board plan. That's when you can start hard casting your fractured sanities, playing out your ruin crabs, where maybe you want to actually just hold up test talents. If they don't have anything on the board, you don't have to play a ruin crab. It's not blocking anything. Let them play the creature, then play that. Play out your answers first. You don't need to start establishing a board. But again, late game, if they get to the late game and they have a roiling vortex out, gonna be honest you probably lost and so that's really the card that you want to beat as a demir player you don't want to get to the late game anymore with burn as demir with esper and azorius you have options you have prismatic ending but really you're looking to end this game relatively early by turn three or sorry by turn four turn three is kind of hard but by turn four you're really looking to create a cinch in that game you're forcing your opponent to react to you at that point and if you're reacting to your opponent by turn four even by turn five you're probably not looking too hot as a demir player but as an esper player you gain access to obviously things like blossoming comms your top decks are a lot more valuable and a lot more powerful against a matchup like this so you can't afford to go to the late game but still you need to hold off your prismatic endings for things like Roiling Vortex and Eidolon of the Great Rebel. Maybe you do need to throw out your Hedron Crabs to chump because you have to understand what your win conditions are. The way you lose is Roiling Vortex and Eidolon taxing you through all your spells. Save your interaction as an Esper, as an Azorius player for those two cards, take the damage. As a Demir player, you're looking to mitigate until you can get that mid game and cast a critical mass of spells. So maybe again, you're still taking the damage from Goblin Guide and Monastery Swift Spear, but more often than not, you're just looking to use your spells, destroy those, outvalue their hand, and then just go boom, 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 mill spell, mill spell. You can't race them. You can't just play more mill spells like Cacophony. You can't do that. It's not going to work. Going into what the mill plan wants to be, early game, the mill plan wants to be cast a Ruin Crab on turn one. You're going to be able to block the Goblin Guide. Establish a board where you can then start casting Drown in the Locks and other counter spells such as Test of Talents or Aether Gusts. And then you want to start mitigating from there. You're countering each spell that they play. Hopefully you're countering the spells on their turn, so the Sorcery Speed stuff. And then you're really just looking to slowly throw in a Cycled Fractured Sanity. Throw in a Tasha's in there while still holding up Counter Magic. You want to, you want to edge things in. 
of course if you have an opportunity just cast archive traps cast the archive traps and ain't nobody stopping you like i said the way you win this game is mitigating casting crypt incursion playing it slow or just casting a billion archive traps all at once obviously if they have rolling vortex you can't really do much about that tough call this is a tough matchup for demir but that's just what you have to do and that's really where this ends if we could go into the specifics of what Esper wants to do, we could go into the specific, specifics of what Azorius wants to do, but generally the plan is really there. I've said this probably four or five times already in this video. Burn knows their plan is better, so you need to mitigate. You need to understand what your win conditions are and what tools you have access to, and that's going to change. As I mentioned, with Demir, you don't have as many tools. You're just hoping that they have a creature every draw, and you can win around the turn four, turn five mark. If you're an Esper, you can actually play a long game with Burn. You just have to answer key threats at key moments. You can't just throw out your removal spells because they're doing damage to you. Take the damage from the Goblin Guide. Take the damage from the Monastery Swiss Spear. You have very good life gain options. Understand what their win conditions are because now you actually have answers to them and you can go long but we're going to end the video off there let me know if this is something that you're looking forward to in the future a bit of a long form video lots of discussion really just you know 30 minutes long of just me talking about how mill and burn interact let me know if this is something that you're interested in and uh i'll make more maybe there's some things that i can shave down give me some suggestions let me know in the comment section down below but we'll end off there Remember that even the impossible is possible, and as we ponder that thought, I hope you'll join me next time as we take a glimpse into the unthinkable.